Hey everyone, welcome to Data Umbrella's webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then I will let Eric take over. So first, uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and then or during the uh, talk, if you have any questions so that you don't forget them, just leave them in the chat and then Eric and answer all your questions. are a non-profit organization. Are my slides moving? Can you confirm if they are moving or not? Yes, it's a bit slow, but they're moving. Okay, so uh, on our team, we have Reshma, who's here. She's a statistician and data scientist. You can find her on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub as Reshma S. I am Beryl Kanali. I'm also a data scientist and statistician, and you can find me on Twitter as Beryl Kanali. We also have a code of conduct, and we are dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone, and we thank you for helping make this a welcoming and friendly community for all. How to support us? There are several ways that you can support the Umbrella. One of the ways is by following a code of conduct so that uh, we can become a welcoming and collaborative space and so that folks can join us again. We also have a Discord community chat where you can ask questions, answer questions, share events, jobs, and any other relevant material. We are also on Open Collective where you can donate. We are on Open Collective as the Tambrella. We are also on Benevity, which is a company merged and above platform, where, for example, if you make a donation of $100, your company matches the same uh, donation. We are on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel's name is Data Umbrella. We have over 60 videos which have different uh, information on data science or general um, libraries on careers in tech. We, you can find our different libraries on our YouTube channel. We can find uh, data science libraries. You can find uh, general tech libraries. You can also find uh, libraries like uh, open source, contributing to open source, like it lands prints, PyMC, and also have a monthly newsletter on Substack. So on Substack, we are uh, as the Tambrella, we have uh, a newsletter that comes out every beginning of the month, and we only send it once a month, so we promise not to spam you. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Next, we have our website. Our website is thetumbrella.org, where we have um, content on list of conferences, open source accessibility and responsibility, burnout, AI ethics, and more. So as you can see, we are on different social media platforms. So you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. You can follow us on Meetup. We are on Meetup where you'll find all our upcoming events. We are on GitHub. There are different ways that you can contribute to the Tumblr on GitHub. And we also have a job board where we post our jobs related to tech. We have live captioning for this webinar in case you need to use the live captioning. There is a live captioning uh, button available, available CC. So feel free to use it if you need it. As I had stated earlier about GitHub, so for our videos, we do timestamps to make them easily accessible to our viewers. So you can contribute by uh, picking one uh, video and uh, adding timestamps to it. For example, if you are a fan of software engineering or software testing for source, like the talk we have today, feel free to uh, pick the issue. And after the video is posted in less than 24 hours or so, you can start um, 
watching it and contributing to the timestamps. Generally, the timestamps don't have to be for the whole video. If a video is long, you can do timestamps to a certain level. You can do timestamps maybe up to 30 minutes, and then uh, someone else might do the rest of the timestamps. So it depends on what you can do. You don't really have to do the timestamps for the whole video. We have several lab so this will be our last event for August. And then on September 8th, we have an event on building a personal brand. And on September 13th, we have an event on TensorFlow.js, an introductory level talk. So we'll go to today's talk. Today's talk is software testing in open source software and data science. And our speaker is Eric Ma. A little bit about Eric. Eric is a principal data scientist at Moderna, which is a research data science uh, company. Prior to Moderna, he was at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research conducting biomedical data science research with a focus on using Bayesian statistical methods in the service of making medicine for patients. He has also uh, worked in health data. Uh, for example, he was a health data fellow in the summer of 2017 and defended his doctoral thesis in the Department of Biomedical, Biological Engineering at MIT in the spring of 2017. He's also an open source software developer and has led to the has led the development of PyGenitor, a cleaning API for cleaning data in Python, and an XVs visualization package for Network X. In addition, he gives back to the open source community through code contributions to multiple projects. His personal motto is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 48. You can follow Eric on Twitter. The, the, the links to his social media platform. So feel free to follow him. He also is also on GitHub and you can look at what he's doing there. So with those few remarks, I think I'll now pass the microphone and the video to Eric. And as I have said, please uh, remember to leave your questions uh, on the chat. You don't, you don't have to wait till the end of the webinar them in the chat. We also have a question and answer section and Eric will go through them as he continues with the talk. Welcome, Eric. All right. Thank you very much, Beryl. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to start the screen share. And let's just make sure that everyone can uh, see what's on the slides. If you can, let me know either in the chat or, you know, hall or something if you're either Reshma or, or Beryl, um, just let me know. Yeah. yeah. All good? All right, amazing, thank you. All right, so it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, the title of today's talk, uh, the long title is uh, Software Testing in Open Source and Data Science. And the short title of the talk is actually Test Your Work. Um, what I'm hoping to convey today uh, is the agenda that I've been very interested in for a long time, which is how do we make our work more reliable uh, as data scientists and perhaps software developers as well. So if you'd like to follow along with the uh, slides on your own, um, I've dropped the link to the slide deck. They're all available up online already. It's up posted up on GitHub pages. Um, you can follow along and browse through it on your own pace. I'm completely unoffended by that, so it's totally OK. All right, so um, my goals today are basically to share some hard-won lessons born out of failures from my past. Uh, I have flailed and failed in my, many creative ways in the past, and I want to make sure that you don't have to flail and fail around in the same ways uh, so that you can flail and fail around in new and creative ways instead. And that's called research, according to one of my old professors. Um, and what I also want to encourage you to do is to maybe start embracing testing as part of your 
uh, workflow as you start doing your either open source or software development work or your uh, data science work. So just to quickly recap where I, who I am, um, I work at Moderna. I did grad school at MIT in bioengineering, got in through the back door, got out through the front door. I can talk about that on hours. It's a, uh, it was a very fun experience uh, doing grad school. Um, but at Moderna, most of what I work on is the use of, uh, with my teammates and I, we work together to uh, uh, use machine learning methods to help design better mRNA protein, uh, mRNA therapeutics that give us the proteins, which are the medicines that we deliver, um, and uh, also use, uh, use machine learning methods for small molecule design to help package everything up in a way that's deliverable, that's in, in a way that is safe and targeted to the exact place that we want it to go in the body. Um, and in addition to that, we also use machine learning methods, invasion statistical methods, as well as network science methods, three things to accelerate and enrich uh, the kind of insights that we can get from our data. All right, that out of the way, like I said, uh, my agenda today is really about testing. And if there's a single core message that I'm hoping that you take away from today, that is if you write automated tests for your work, then the quality of your work will go up and the quality of your work, your work will therefore become trustworthy. Now, some of us make a distinction between software engineering slash software development work and data science work. Hopefully through today's talk, you'll also see the link between the two and, in, and therefore why testing applies not only to software work, but also to data science work, all right? Um, and in between, basically the connection is that data science uh, must involve code at some point. And because it must involve code at some point, it is you are effectively writing software when you write code and therefore testing is necessary. Okay, so I've broken my talk into two pieces. Uh, the first is testing in software and what that looks like. Uh, and the second is testing in data science and what that looks like as well. So let's start about start with the section on testing in software. And to do that, I'm gonna answer five questions. Why do we wanna do testing? What does a test look like? How do we make tests uh, executable in a way that isn't manual, but instead automated? What kind of benefits will you get? And finally, what kind of tests can you write for, uh, 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 for the kind of software that you, you might develop? So let's start first with testing. Why do we want to do testing? When you write code and you start using that code, you are always going to be making the assumption that the code will behave exactly the way you want, given the kind of data that you're supposed to pass into that code, right? What testing does is give us a way to help falsify that hypothesis that our code works the way that we want. If we write tests for our code, then we will have tested those assumptions. And if we don't write tests for our code, we will leave those assumptions untested about whether our code works, all right? I'm gonna share a very quick story from uh, my time in grad school. Because when I first did my version one of my uh, thesis code, it was a gigantic mess. It was horrible. Um, it was four or five Python scripts that had to be run in an exact order with no refactoring, no functions, no testing, minimal documentation. It was my brain dump, essentially. These were the early days of Jupyter Notebooks as well, so I also had some hacky notebooks lying around. None of my code was tested. The only way I knew to test was to rerun the entire code, uh, code base, and it took 16 hours-ish to finish. And if there was a bug anywhere, I would be delayed. And so you can tell that I was in a very, very bad position with respect to my code. I had a lot of assumptions that were not explicitly tested. When things got painful enough, it, they got painful enough when it took basically an entire day to rerun the entire code base to reproduce results, only to figure out that there was a bug somewhere. So when things got in immensely, immensely, immensely painful, that's when I learned 
um, that software testing was actually a thing and that we had to break up our code into smaller chunks and write tests that ensure the generality and usability of that code, each little chunk of code. And so for that reason, I've learned my lesson, uh, whether I'm doing software development work uh, for the tooling that I use, or whether I'm doing actual data science work, software tests always come up because without the tests, I will have untested assumptions about whether my code works. And that is an incredibly uh, fragile position to be in. I don't know if you've seen this comedian, Stephen He on, on YouTube, where he goes emotional damage. That emotional damage is what happens when you have, uh, when you have broken code and fragile, fragile assumptions. So let's talk a little bit about what a software test looks like. We know why software testing is important, but how exactly do you do that software test? So let me give you an example. This is an example that is simplified from the PyGenitor library. There is a function called clean names. And what it does is it essentially um, cleans up your column names in a data frame. It does one and one thing only, right? As you can see from here, uh, what, uh, the, what this function is doing is essentially taking your code, taking my code, turning, um, taking my data frame, sorry, looping over every column, and then uh, converting it into a string, converting it to lower lowercase, and replacing spaces with underscores, and finally stripping the underscores from the ends of the column. And that is how we clean this column name. So uh, clean a column name. And so this is what the clean names function does. How would we write a test for this? So one example, um, so I'm going to start by giving an example of a very minimal kind of test that we can write. When we test, what we want to do is we want to test for expected behavior. So if I have a data frame with these columns, uh, apple, banana, and cauliflower sunshine, what, what we'll do is we'll pass this data frame through the clean names function and then assert that there is uh, that the cleaned column names have column names that are equivalent to what we expect them to be, right? And if you look, uh, if you read up the uh, PyTest documentation, there is uh, a page that is titled The Anatomy of a Test. And it says that there are essentially four steps where you arrange the data that needs to go into a function. You act on the data to produce a result, a result from that function. And then you do a bunch of assertions, which are uh, checks that you want to hold true, things that you want to hold true uh, for the result. And then finally, you do a bit of cleanup if you're doing anything stateful. And there's nothing in this case because the data frame goes away from memory. So this is the essence of testing. It's really nothing fancy if you think about it. Um, we go in, we write a function, and then we write essentially one other function that states explicitly, I want, I believe that the output should be blah, given this input. And that's it. That is the simplest test that you can write. And having something like this already is better, infinitely better than having nothing. OK, so this is all nice and good. But surely, I don't want to be writing 17 functions and having 17 test functions scattered all over the place and having to execute all 17 of them one at a time, right? So that would be an, an awfully big waste of time. So how do we make these tests automated? There is a thing called PyTest, right? And I mentioned it earlier just now. It is a framework for testing in Python that is extremely popular uh, and, in my opinion, should be a, an industry standard at this point for Pythonistas. Um, what you do with PyTest is you basically install it into whatever your project environment is. I'm showing an example using Conda environments. And then you run PyTest from your uh, from your uh, root directory. And if you get, if everything, if all of the tests, what, sorry, what PyTest will do is it'll look throughout your source directory for everything that looks like it might be a test function and it will go ahead and execute all of those test functions. If all of the test functions pass, you'll get a green bar uh, at the end in your terminal. And if some tests fail, then you'll get uh, the errors surfaced up to your terminal. And that will let you help. That will help you debug as well. 
And this is one way that you can run automated tests on your test suite. But actually, you can take it. You can even take it um, one step further. If you use GitHub or GitLab or other equivalent Bitbuckets, uh, Bit, other equivalent platforms like Bitbucket, um, you actually can find ways to run uh, code tests on every single commit. And you can do things like set up GitHub Actions, uh, for example, to make sure that on every single commit, you always run all of the tests and make and you never and you sort of commit to yourself, pun unintended, you commit to yourself that you won't merge uh, any pull request unless all tests pass, right? And what this gives you is a whole suite of benefits. So let's talk about those benefits. Think about the case when you have code changes happening. You'll notice that I've got, in this case, an extra line that I've added into the code. This is to handle even more complicated uh, column names, things that might have dots or hyphens or quotation marks inside there. And what we want to do here is substitute all of those punctuations with underscores. So now I've made a change. How do I know that uh, the old behavior of the code is still preserved? Now, that is something that I might end up assuming about the code if I don't write a test. So what, what can we do here? Well, first off, if we run PyTest and all of the tests that we've written thus far pass, then we have guarantees over what we expect to see uh, to, to be working, right? And if the test fails, then we've actually falsified our assumption that the change that we introduced does not break our expected behavior. At the same time, if we know that the old test does not cover all of the cases that we had expected to see before, then we might actually want to update our expectations by modifying the test and adding in a bit of change to the example. So in this case, instead of putting apple only, we put apple.sauce. And over here, we change what we expect to see as well. We should see underscore uh, snake cased applesauce. All right. So let's summarize this. What are the benefits of testing? You actually get guarantees against breaking changes. Because if you run your automated test suite and your change broke an existing test, which, docu which effectively serves as like a documentation of what you expected to work, then you can figure out, figure out where, those where those breaking changes happen earlier and catch them and fix them before, uh, before you actually go and release your code or merge in a commit. Right? And secondly, the big benefit that you'll see here is that because you, in a test, you have to arrange, act, and then assert, you effectively have to set up an example of how to use that code uh, that you've just written. And so you actually get example-based documentation for your code inside the test suite straight away. One other way to think about tests is that testing is a contract. It's a contract between current you and future you, right? Current you knows some stuff about the code. And when you write a test, all you're doing is encoding your knowledge inside code such that future you can make it much easier, can find it much easier to, to, to catch up with what current you is thinking. OK, so now let's talk about what kind of tests might exist. Uh, what it, This is more a bit of a se section for vocabulary and nomenclature so that it helps you talk about testing. There is what we might call a unit test. And what this test does is it checks that in the, an individual function uh, that performs one logical unit of work uh, does exactly what you, what you think it does. And this is a test that you should strive to write. This is the type of test that is really, really uh, handy to write. The second type of test that you can write is a mere execution test. And what all that this one does is just take in some data and execute the function without checking the output. There are some situations where you may be forced to do this, one being uh, you ran out of time, you need to deliver, so you just want to make sure that the thing executes. So that's one, one potential way uh, time where you may need to just write an execution test. The other one may be, it may be a little bit too uh, difficult in the current state of code to check 
the outputs in a way that's sane. And so you might want to just execute the code first, make sure it runs, and then come back later and try to re re-architect the code such that it's easier to reason about and test. Then the third type of test that you can uh, write is an integration test. And what this does is it actually checks that a system is working properly when it is run as an integrated unit, right? And so to use this one sparingly, um, especially if your tests are long, like if they take more than a second or two seconds to execute, that's usually a, a sign that you've got like pretty long running code. And so you'll want to use this one sparingly if, if that's the case. Um, if your system is actually fast, then actually go ahead, use, use uh, integration tests whenever you can. OK, so that's all that I have on software testing. Um, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about what Hadley Wickham has said before. He says, you can't do data science in a GUI. I kind of mostly agree with what he says. And I actually 100% agree with the sentiment and maybe partly, mostly only agree with um, uh, the, the exact phrasing, perhaps. There are some aspects of data science that will involve a GUI if you're using Tableau, right? Like, or if you're using Excel, just to do, just to do some quick hacky exploration. That's using a GUI to do your to do your work. That's totally legit. But ultimately, if you want to ship anything of particular use that is non-trivial in nature, you're gonna need to write code. And so what this means that is that because data science work more often than not needs code and your code is more or less equal to software, this implies that you will be doing some kind of software work to do data science work. Whether that's writing one or two functions or writing an entire library of functions, you will your, your likelihood of writing code is pretty darn high. So if you embrace testing, your this will be good for your heart, your gut, your mind, your body, your soul, everything, right? Embrace testing in data science and you'll be able to, you, you'll reap a lot of benefits there. So let me highlight three places in data science code where you might be able to use testing. The first one is in machine learning model code. The second one is in data. And the third is in your data pipelines. So the first one I want to talk through is actually coming from uh, uh, real world examples that I've encountered at Moderna. We use PyTorch Lightning everywhere in Moderna. And our machine learning model code tends to look like this, where you have some project source code library and you have a custom model, custom data module, and a trainer object, that a trainer function that we need to define. And so we instantiate, usually our models, uh, our projects will involve at some point instantiating a model, instantiating a data module, instantiating a trainer object, and then using the trainer to fit our model with our data module. So let's think about what kind of things do we need guarantees on, right? That's, that's the whole premise of testing. What do we need guarantees on? We'll, we'll test for those. Well, first off, if model and the data module must work together, then the data module must serve, serve up tensors that are of the shape that model accepts. And so what can we test here? We can test, I think, at least four things. You can do a unit test to check that the data module produces correctly shaped outputs when executed. You can do another unit test for the model such that when it's given random inputs, it gives correctly shaped outputs. You can do an integration test between the data module and the model, such that you pass the mod data module outputs into the model and make sure the model produces correctly shaped outputs. And finally, you can do an execution test, which says that your model does not fail in a training loop with the trainer and the data module. So let's talk about the four examples over here. So if you want to do data module shape testing, you can do something like what we see on the screen here. You arrange by setting up and configuring your data module. You act by uh, 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 asking the data module to serve up uh, the XY pair, right? Your in, uh, predictor 
and your target variables. And then you do an assertion to make sure that the shape of uh, the tensors are all correct. Right? So that's one way that you can do testing in a machine learning model ca case with a data module. Then let's talk about the model input-output shapes. Right? We can do something like this guy over here. So over here, um, we have uh, a thing for testing model shapes. And say, I, for example, I'm presuming that I'm using a JAX model rather than a PyTorch Lightning model. Uh, we can in ensure reproducibility by setting random seeds over here. Um, and then so we rearrange our data by producing randomly distributed data and, random and, and instantiating a model object. And then we act by producing outputs. And then finally, we assert that the output shapes are, uh, are correct. And if you're a statistician, you can even go one step further and check that the model is producing outputs that are on the correct support, right? Like if, you think, if, it, if your values can only be positive, then make sure you don't get anything that's negative. OK, what about models and data modules working together? That's also doable. You arrange by starting up with a data module uh, and instantiating a model, and then finally asking the data module to produce uh, x and y tensors. You act by passing the tensors the X tensors through the model. And finally, you assert by checking the shapes. And that is also one other check that you can do over here. And you can also do the same support check if you'd like. Finally, here's the execution test. You arrange, and then you act and don't bother with assertions. And so you do a model data module uh, instantiation and a trainer with maybe a small number of epochs. So you don't train for too long, right? Or a small number of steps. You can even just do. Uh, three or four steps or three or four iterations rather than two epochs, for example. And then you do a fit, and that's it, right? And so this, uh, you, you wouldn't want to do like a full training run, right? That would be quite unreasonable if you want to make sure that your tests run quickly. But nonetheless, this execution test now states that if there is any change, is set up such that if there is any change in the model or the data module, you will be able to catch any breaking changes really quickly. All right. Next up, let's talk about data validation. So this is the other term for testing data. So when you might have a function called func and it accepts a data frame, and what you'd need to do is you need to assert some properties of that data frame being correct, right? So you might say, we want to make sure that there is a column, some column that is present. We want to make sure that that column contains integers. And you might want to make sure that there are no null values inside here before we go on to uh, do the rest of uh, the data processing logic. So how can we, how can we do this? How can we do uh, data testing or data validation uh, inside our code? Well, there's actually a really cool tool called Pandera. Um, and what it lets you do is it lets you de declare schemas to declare your expectations. So I might have, for the same three criteria that we had specified before, might have a data frame schema defined such that we need to make sure that some column must exist, that it must be of an integer type, and that it cannot contain any null values. Right? And that's the syntax for making sure that this is true. Cool. And so once you have that schema declared in code, you can import that schema object into your function and uh, use it to validate the data frame that you have before uh, executing the rest of your function logic. And so what this does is it actually ensures that your runtime validation code is abstracted out and it's much more readable. And therefore, you're now able to have guarantees over the data that comes in. Right? I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you pass in data and then uh, your function fails in some really weird way, and you can't tell why until you start digging through the data. Well, if you declare properties that your data are supposed to have up front, then you can very quickly figure out what's going wrong based on the input data. Final thing I will talk about is testing um, pipeline code. So if you think about it, pipelines are functions, right? So if they accept data, you can do validations. Then you chain those functions together. And then now you have 
um, uh, your output and you can validate your output if you have an out output schema as well. You think carefully about this. You got a pipeline, every function in there, func one through four, is a unit operation that can be unit tested. So you can actually set up unit tests for your pipeline by doing runtime data validation as well as execution of the, the unit functions themselves. In addition to that, your whole pipeline can also be integration tested, right? So you'd again do your range, your act and assert thing. Now, of course, we're making assumptions here that your pipeline is quick to run. Uh, you'll, you want to make sure that if you want to do any kind of integration testing, that it doesn't really slow your test and fix, test, fix, test, fix loop. Um, so you want to make sure your tests are quick to run uh, as much as possible. And, and, but then that, that is also, you know, one legitimate thing that we all can, uh, can, can adopt as a practice inside our data code. And there's one more thing. Uh, as this morning, as I was thinking through this whole problem about like data and data validation and the likes and how it interacts with our functions, I realized we need a way to mock up realistic fake data. And as it turns out, Pandera actually gives you the ability to use your data frame schema to generate new data frames that look like exactly what you think they're supposed to. And so if you have a situation where you need to have you need to be able to generate fake data and you don't want to use put sensitive real data inside your test suite you can actually use the data frame schemas to help you with generating data that you pass into your test function that help you then test the code that to make sure it's correct right and then because i've worked on pymc and i've heard i know all about uh, i know that probabilistic models are actually generative models of data as it turns out probabilistic models are also a great way to generate fake data. So what you do is you instantiate your model. And if you're familiar with PyMC, you'll know that you obtain posterior distribution estimates of your key parameters of interest in a model. But you also can use the model to generate fake data by doing a sample from the posterior predictive. And you can generate real, like, real looking observations without having to put real data inside your test suite, All right? So that's uh, an enlight uh, uh, a flash of inspiration or, uh, yeah, it's a flash of inspiration that came to me this morning. Um, so it's, it's kind of a cool idea. And I'm hoping uh, with more embracing of PyMC and its usage in the industry that we'll see more of the use of probabilistic modeling to help generate synthetic data uh, for you, for our use. So really the philosophy here is that of defensive programming. If you test your work, whether you're doing software development work or data science work, by integrating testing into your work, you're engaging in defensive programming. And testing is just one manifestation of that. I want to make two points about testing. Testing has two effects here. Firstly, testing raises the quality of your work. By testing your code consistently and often, you're saving yourself long-term headaches in the long run. You're also improving code quality such that you're able to uh, reason more cleanly about your code in the future. Secondly, I want to make sure that this other point is, is conveyed really strongly. Testing is other-centric. It is not self-centered. Right? Um, when you do testing, others can now begin to feel confident about your code and understand where their assumptions of your code may be incorrect. Because if they run your code and find that through modifying something in your code, they break a test, now they have at least a contract between past you and current them that things ought to behave in a certain way, right? So this is really an other centric way of working. Uh, and if you think about the golden rule where you do unto others what you have others do unto you, when you go to an open source library and you see that it's like well tested, well documented, and well engineered, you have a lot of confidence in using that package and you'll adopt it, right? Very naturally. Whereas if you don't, uh, if that package doesn't have all of these tests, then things look a little flaky. And you're not really sure whether you're, you should be able to, to rely on that code, right? So 
Uh, I think one one of one thing that's really important is if we adopt an other centric, other centered mindset, um, we're uh, making the world just a little bit better with the code that we write. Okay, so if you have, if you're curious, I've done some, I've done analogous talks on this same topic, and they're all available online as well. Um, and I've really through since 20, 2013, so close to nine years of data science work from grad school till now, um, through nine years of work have really come to realize that for my work to be of impact, I need to adopt software skills and part of software skills is embracing testing. So whether I'm building tooling or whether I'm building models, uh, embracing testing is actually a really, really good idea. And uh, I'd like to invite you to go and check out some of the other ideas there. There's, it is a growing topic on Twitter. If you follow a few other people, Vicky Boykiss and Eugene Yen, for example, they're all talking and blab talking about this idea and blabbering about, there's a lot of blabber about blabbering about this idea of testing in our data work uh, that is growing. So it's a, it's a growing realization there. So in summary, write tests for your code, write tests for your data, and write tests for models. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, uh, if people have any questions, please ask in the chat. In the meantime, I do have a question for you, um, yes. which is, um, why do you suppose um, in say classes and education, I've been in, um, I did, I did, a, um, took a bunch of courses in data science and Python. Why do you, I, I feel like testing is not really highlighted or it, it, it's not, you know, there's not as much of a focus on it as there should be. Why do you think that is? Yeah, um, I have a few hypotheses. Uh, they are unverified assumptions, maybe. Uh, one of them is that testing has been traditionally viewed as a software problem and not a data science problem. Uh, and that may be the biggest driver. Uh, the second biggest driver that I can think of on the spot is that data science curricula tend to work with non-messy data and uh, perhaps, yeah, in, in, order to, in order to avoid the complexities naturally, I mean, this is necess necessary inside uh, uh, an, an educational setting, you have to extract away some of the messiness of the world in order to teach some other concepts that may be deemed more important. And as a result, you lose uh, the messiness of the real world in your data, and you don't have a lot of um, contextualized, what do you call, contextualized practice with wrestling with the messiness of the world. Um, and so, it's, it's a tougher topic to teach in a natural fashion. A lot of, I, that's perhaps the second, second one, that second driver I, I, that I can think of uh, on the spot um, for why testing really isn't taught in an in a, in a, in a educational setting. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I mean, like, uh, Rashma, what, what are your uh, thoughts or opinions on that? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to turn my camera. You know, as someone, you know, I'm a statistician and I worked in pharmaceutical for a long time. And my very first job was an educational testing service. And all we ever did was check data, not necessarily in the coding way, but it gets checked along the way. It gets checked. There's um, coding checks, there's visual checks. We call them edit checks in pharmaceutical, mm. um, you know, um, a little bit different in Python, um, but I, I I was surprised and you know and we did have other programmers that would do more formal checks you know mm -hmm. like database checks and things like that. Um, I don't I don't know why. I mean, a lot of times I do ask myself, I don't know why they don't do this in data science because pharma is so highly regulated as well. You know? Right, right. Um, Actually, now now that you you've mentioned that you've been in like two two industries, there's one one more idea that that comes to mind. It's that um, tests involve semantics. Tests for data, sorry, involve semantics. And semantics are necessarily uh, domain dependent. 
And so if you're in a general purpose classroom setting, you're not necessarily with, without a, without necessarily having a, a, a domain that we're domain problem that we're trying to, you know, tackle, it may be less natural, I guess, to introduce data testing, testing of your models and that sort of thing, um, because the tests are so contextualized, right? Like um, maybe the machine learning code is a little bit easier to teach because it's general purpose and it crosses domains. But if I were to do something bio, right? And I, I, I teach someone how to write a bioinformatics oriented test, it's not gonna be of interest to someone who's doing finance. Um, it may serve as an example, but I'd also have to put in perhaps one and a half times the effort to bring the finance person onto the same page, perhaps, and and um, let help them understand, you know, the context for writing a test to make sure that, for example, my nucleotides translate correctly into proteins. That might that might be a third third thing that that explains why. Um, I am seeing some questions in the chat. How did Engineers pre-testing libraries deal with data verification and securing. Uh, Makija, I, I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that question uh, because I lived in a world post-testing libraries. Um, so perhaps <laughs> we might need to do some history digging here to figure out. Um, and then you, your other question is, how can non-data engineers and data engineers better discuss testing data down a pipeline where there's some kind of handoff? That's a good question. Um, let me think about that. How can you better do this discussion? One of my friends, Jesse Johnson, writes a blog about scaling biotech and he talks a lot about language. Harmonizing language and getting everybody on the same page. As I found in my day job at Moderna and Novartis, as actually an incredibly is harder than doing modeling. Um, modeling is easy in light of uh, <laughs> making people agree on the same vocabulary. So perhaps one of the things we need to do is, you know, bring people in the same room and say, describe the problem and how the problem is going to impact the non-data engineer people. You know, like if you don't tell me what your expectations over the data look like, then you're going to find that six months down the road, we're going to take longer and longer to make any types of changes into the data pipelines, right? Um, and so connecting the pain point of the data person to the non-data person more generally, I think is, a, is the, the thing that needs to happen. There's the, the author, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, talks about asymmetries in life. I think his book is called Skin in the Game. So we kind of want to have our non-data colleagues um, have skin in our game in the data world. And that involves a lot of connecting, understanding their problem space and building empathy on their problem space, but also at the same time, educating and getting them to understand the pain points down Downstream, yeah, skin in the game, exactly. You, you have down, you have downstream effects if you don't have skin in my game and I don't have skin in your game, right? Like that, that might be uh, one way to to get around this problem. It's in my mind the answer to that question, which is how to get non-data engineers and data engineers better discuss testing data. We can talk all all day long about vocabulary, but the fundamental problem is a people problem, and that is harder than modeling, and it all it is all about skin in the game, in my opinion. Okay, so then we have um, a few comments from Mary uh, talking about uh, career transition, how it's different in the data world. Uh, she, right, Mary also doesn't understand why testing is not included in the curriculum. And it's, uh, it's a hard question, I'm guessing. Uh, and I think Makisha has another one. Um, big data is always changing the look and feel of the nature of data. What future skill sets will an engineer benefit from? that will give them better time when preparing tests? Let me think about that one. That's another good question. I've had a hypothesis, similarly unverified, that if we understand 
how our data were generated down to the level that we can write a probabilistic model of it, then we are more than 70% of our way to solving the vast majority of data problems that we'll encounter. And you'll find that if you can write a data generating process for your data, you're more likely also to get the causal structure of how you get your observed data correct. And when you have the that level of understanding, writing tests becomes much easier. So that's my hypothesis there. So I'm going to say, take a bet and say that the future skill set we should all learn is probabilistic modeling. Because if you can do exactly as I had shown back here, which is writing a probabilistic model to generate what your data looks like, then uh, you'll have a very, very deep understanding over that data. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my, perhaps the one thing that I'll offer as a response to the question. And then Henry has the question, what can I do with functions developed for other developers? Should I test, it, test its results? Um, check to see if that function is tested in some other setting. And if the, if the answer is yes, like for example, NumPy functions, you don't really need to go and test them anymore. Uh, if it is untested, then you might want to offer to write a test for its results and you can start by simply treating the function as a black box and giving examples uh, that you know what the inputs and outputs ought to look like. Um, and you know, if, if the package is open source, you can offer to uh, offer up those tests that you've designed as part of the test suite for that, um, for that package as well. That's perhaps something that I, I, would, I would suggest over here. All right, then we have Si Wang asking, are you testing against requirement specification that is approved or against what's in your mind? It's the answer is against requirement specifications, whether it is approved or what's in your mind, right? So uh, functions should behave according to expectations. So that is, um, so as long as you know what you're expecting from your functions, you can write the test to, yeah, as long as you know what, what the expected behavior of a function is, you can write the corresponding test, all right? Cool, and then uh, Sarah Munga has a question. As a beginner in data science world, just attended a bootcamp, no testing was mentioned. What resources can you recommend to someone like me? There's a lot of, there are a lot of free resources that are available online. Um, I will admit there's no systematic way to test, uh, to teach testing, because a lot of testing involves context. So, uh, what I would recommend, Sarah, is if you are in a position where you can afford the time to do so, then uh, go and embark on a for whatever project that you're embarking on. Uh, try to see if you can take a dive into using, say, PyTest if you're using the Python ecosystem of tooling to write tests for your, uh, for your data, for your models, for your utility functions. It takes practice to gain the intuition. And when I first started, my tests were not the best, as, were not the best either. They were very much example-based tests. But as I mentioned, example-based tests are better than having no tests at all. And as you think harder and harder, about your tests, you'll figure out um, how to generalize your tests and generalize your functions more. All right. So hopefully that that gives you something to chew on. All right. With that, I think we're at the uh, end of questions. Eric? Sorry. Um, I just want to add a few things. The first yes. is, um, you know, where it said no testing was mentioned, what resources? Um, this talk is a great resource. There's another talk that was done by Marietta who is one of the um, core contributors to the Python language. 
and she did a, 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 a presentation on continuous integration and testing as well. But one of the reasons that, you know, we organized this event at Data Umbrella is because there is a understanding that this is an important skill that is not often, you know, taught mm. in formal programs. Um, and so that's actually some of the inspiration for some of the talks that we um, organize over at Data Umbrella. Um, by the way, um, Eric, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A tab. It's, ah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll share the link to Marietta's video. Um, I don't, can you see the Q&A tab? The yes, yes. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit using GitHub Actions to run automated testing? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So GitHub Actions is, the way I think about GitHub Actions is basically as a robot that I can program to do anything I want that runs on every single commit. And so uh, if you would want to see an example of uh, testing using GitHub Actions, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to the PyJanitor, github.com, janitor devs, PyJanitor, as well as github.com slash pymc devs pymc. So there are two repos that I think are very done, done very well. Um, the way that you set up a GitHub action, say, for example, using pymc as an example, uh, is you go to the top level of the repo, you do a .github folder, workflows subfolder, and then you have a YAML file that's used to configure, um, uh, that is used to configure uh, uh, the, the test runner. And what this does is it goes in and it says, uh, this one's fairly complicated. What it does is it basically runs all of the tests inside here or here or here here or here, we'll run all of the tests inside a test matrix in PyMC. Um, and what you will see over here is that it you, there's lots of awesome tooling that's available in GitHub Actions to be able to set up the test environment exactly as you have it for development. Uh, and then, where it is, where is it? Right there, line 131. That there is where we run the test suite uh, on GitHub Actions, all right? And so this is one example. Uh, the PyMC one is fairly elaborate. I think we try to, uh, for open source uh, friendliness, beginner friendliness, sorry, we try to keep the test suite simple and the structure simple in, in PyJanitor. We have fast tests and slow tests. So the slow tests are called turtle and the Fast tests are called not turtle. Um, and so we basically set up the environment and then we run the unit test right over there. Um, and then we also use some other tooling uh, to, to help us record and measure historical, his, uh, measure and record historical code co testing coverage to make sure that we're trying to cover as many lines of code with our tests as possible. All right. So that's. Uh, two examples of how to use GitHub Actions to run automated testing. GitHub Actions may, at first glance, feel like it's very um, complicated, um, but if you, but I think on there are two things that have helped me over here. One is that their documentation is very well done, and two, uh, as long as you remember that GitHub Actions is nothing more than a little robot that runs code on every commit, then you'll be in a great position to set up automated testing for your for your workflows. So I'm hopeful, Jennifer, that that answered your question. So it looks like that is all the questions. Um, let me just double check the, um, yeah. All right, and Rashima did put a link in chat about uh, a tutorial on GitHub Actions, which is a really good one. Great. So, um, Eric, thank you so much for um, for doing this talk and sharing with the community and taking time out of your work day to present to Data Umbrella. Um, and, you know, we'll be in touch and the video recording should be up within 24 hours. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot for hosting, Reshma and Beryl. <laughs>